Hi, this is Father Gary Kiriakou, Armed with Faith. We're here with Dr. Ann Bezaridis and Alex Demos. We're going to talk about some great youth ministry stuff. Dr. Ann Bezaridis, how are you? It's nice to have you. Please tell us uh, your role, your title, and uh, what Alex does for the office as well. Father Gary, it is so good to be here with you. We're thrilled to be uh, on your this amazing podcast. So yes, my name is Dr. Ann Mitsakos Bezaridis. I am director of the Office of Vocation and Ministry at Hellenic College Holy Cross, where I've been serving for 18 years. I'm also the executive director of the Crossroad Institute. Um, Crossroad uh, is a high school summer program for juniors and seniors for our Orthodox young people. And Alex Demos is our summer program director. So Alex, uh, I, I'm from the Boston area. Uh, I'm married to a pediatric cardiologist. We have three boys. and. I'm in this parenting adventure myself um, and uh, just love our church and love our young people and love figuring out ways that we can bring the two closer together. So Alex, will you introduce yourself and say where you're from? Sure, yeah. Um, my name is Alex Demos. Uh, I've been the director of the Crossroads Summer Program since August. I've worked on Crossroads staff the two years prior to that. Um, I'm originally from Denver. Uh, I'm a seminarian at Holy Cross right now in my third year. Um, so very blessed to be here in Boston. Uh, I got married four months ago to my wife, Constance, who is from the Bay Area um, in Oakland. So um, we're very pleased to be in Boston serving this wonderful program. That's awesome. Alex, hold on a second. Um, you're a student and the program director at the same time. God bless yeah. you. Yes. And, you're new, and you're newlywed. So yeah. you've got a whole lot of things going on here. You, you've got hats in the air. I was going to say that Dr. Ann has a whole bunch of hats in the air, but you've got hats in the air. And yeah. you married a girl from Oakland? I, I, I served in Oakland for three years. So I'm, I'm sorry that we have to do a little bit of personal stuff on here before we get started. But who, who what's your? Uh, yeah, so her maiden name is uh, Marku. Uh, oh my God, you married Constance Marku? Yes, yes. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I knew her since she was a little girl. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes. That's so, awesome. She, so she's obviously living in Boston with you now. She's living in Boston. Yes. Um, working for the school. So. Oh my God. What a small, small world. Tell her I said hello, please. Of course. I absolutely will. Great yeah. memories. Great memories there. That's great. So look at, here's, here's the thing with here at Armed with Faith, we're trying to give people the ammunition they need to go and inspire our youth to live a, a, a better life in the church, to, to grow closer to Christ. How, does Crossroad and the ministries that you provide do that for our youth? And, and why should a parent consider sending their, their kid to Crossroad? Why should they give them to you? Yeah, that's great. I'll say a few things. And then Alex, I'd love you to say a few. Uh, I'll talk sort of from a, the perspective of a parent and um, somebody who designed this program. I designed it with a team of seminarians uh, when I was 27. Uh, I was in doctoral work and Basically, we had a Lilly Endowment grant um, to start the program, and it was to dream up a kind of, it actually was, we're funding four seminaries and faith-based colleges to offer kids richer theological food than they often could get in a parish, not because the parish didn't want to give it to them, but more that it was often some kids who just really were asking hard questions and needed a peer group and access to really brilliant wonderful theologians and pastors who could wrestle with them around tough questions and, you know, spark their faith together um, all, all at once. And actually, the, the guy who had the idea um, for these programs, a guy by the name of Craig Dykstra, came to it because he, as a teenager, um, his pastor had them, he and a small group reading Bonhoeffer together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, and realized just how much his soul needed um, that was more than, you know, he would usually get in Sunday school or th just through general participation in church. And so we like to think of Crossroad as AP theology. Okay. As a time to just, I mean, it's also a blast. Kids have a great time and plenty of kids come who are not sort of your classic AP student, you know, gunner on that. But we know that when kids get exposed to the breadth and depth of our faith, they just get energized. And when they do it with a peer group who is also sitting around them willing and interested, it's completely inspirational. From a parent perspective, I know that there's this 
important stage of young people's faith where they need to figure out if the faith of their family is theirs, if the faith that their parent has is theirs, is it mine, I get to choose. Um, and so what we've noticed over, you know, we have now over a thousand alums is it really is for so many alums, this watershed moment of, okay, yeah, this is mine, you know, and we've had, you know, we're about to hire somebody who grew up at St. Vladimir Seminary, you know, and, and really it was crossroad. So he had all the best access, but it was crossroad that, that enlivened his faith in a new way and showed him how, um, how powerful, beautiful is uh, and what it's like to um, decide you want to follow Christ with a group of peers who also do. So it's a, it's a summer program where um, junior kids that finish their junior year in high school and kids that finish their senior year in high school, or is it is it finish their sophomore year going into their junior year and juniors going into their senior year? You've got it. The first one we've we've focused traditionally focused on finishing. So you apply in your junior or senior year of high school. Okay. So you come as a rising senior or rising college freshman. Very good. And then um, they're with you for, it seems about seven to 10 days. 10 days. Yep. Okay. It's a 10 day program. We have, and, uh, yep. This summer we have one in Boston, uh, one in San Francisco for the very first time. Very We're excited. so thrilled. Very excited at, the, at the West Coast represented. At the okay. invitation of Metropolitan Yadasimos, who in 2007, I have a printed letter from him. I could probably pull it up and show you on screen. Uh, asking for Crossroad to be on the West Coast. At that time, I had babies and I thought he is crazy. <laughs> Forgive me, your eminence, if you're like, <laughs> but, um, but so it's taken us a while to respond to his incredible invitation, but he saw what Crossroad was doing for young people in their faith. And so, so we're finally responding to his invitation. Very and then we go to Chicago. So we have a 10 day program in Chicago. So that's the order, Boston, San Francisco, Chicago this summer. That's right. Yep. Great. And, um, and, Alex, how did you get involved with all of this? You said, are you an alum of, of Crossroad? Did you participate? I actually never was a participant in Crossroad. Okay. I, my first experience was as a staff member uh, when I came to seminary. So um, it, even then it was really life-changing for me, so. Yeah. Yeah, um, and and, and in, in what way? Because you were already at the seminary, right? So your faith was already kind of developed in a way my that faith, you, you yeah, my faith the church. was uh, solidified, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Um, I had been working with youth for the prior like eight years at that point. So um, seeing how Crossroad uh, really nurtures the faith of young people, um, you know, developmentally, high schoolers are at this place where they're almost obsessed with identity, purpose, and belonging. And, um, you know, that, that matters to all of us, but, but high schoolers are, for the first time, really opening up to, to what those three things mean to them and, and how they interact with it. Crossroad addresses um, these three um, ideas in terms, of, in terms of church. Who am I, who is God, and who is my neighbor? Um, identity, purpose, and belonging. So um, it's, it's a unique way that is not offered in other programs to get them to experience the wider world of orthodoxy with deep theological study and uh, they get to do it with, as Anne said, peers who are interested in the exact same thing. How many, how many applicants do you get and how many do you accept every year? It varies from year to year. You know, we, there have been some years that we can't um, accept everybody um, coming out of COVID. We have a, you know, wait list for, it. some of it is just timing and stuff. We have a wait list for Boston. We have room in San Francisco. So it's in a, and we're, and Chicago is full right now. So. Um, but for those of you who may be listening and can think of kids who just, this may be something that changes their life, we would love you to send them to San Francisco. We, that's a pretty unusual that at this point in time, we, we have some openings. So we, we just love people to spread the word. We, we think of it as, you know, bringing kids on a mat through a roof to see Jesus. Oh my God, I love that. It's one of my favorite gospel passages too. We, side note, I always think that I'd be one of the four friends that would be the guy that's like, guys, it's not a good idea. No, really, we're, we're going to rip the roof off? Come on. Oh, really? Come on. Totally, Come on, totally. totally. We're going to get there's more. Gotta another, there's got to be another, there's got to yeah. be another way, yeah. right? Can we just wait till tomorrow? I'd yeah, right. totally be that guy, right? And so I can see that you two would be the ones that are saying, no, 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 let's go, let's go. We got to get this done. 
That's awesome. I love it. Um, now, with uh, with Boston, Chicago, and San Francisco, these are titles of metropolises, right? So I'm wondering, uh, do you have to be part of the metropolis of Chicago, part of the metropolis of San Francisco or Boston to apply and go there? Or can you be from anywhere in the country? Anywhere from the country. And we actually, we are definitely recruit from all jurisdict, all Orthodox jurisdictions. Okay, so it's not just a Greek Orthodox ministry. Not just about 60 to 70% of our kids do come from the GOA, but that reflects the, the sort of popula Orthodox population in the country as well. So okay. we do, we, tr we try to recruit um, you know, we've got Antiochians, OCA, Serbian, um, Ethiopian. It so is you one say, of the strengths. I'm sorry, Alex. I was just going to say it is one of the strengths of the program that for the first time they get to interact with Orthodox people from different backgrounds and really form bonds with those people that they're not going to camp with necessarily. Um, it, it brings a whole new perspective. So, right, right, right. Um, and, and, and Alex mentioned camp. And let me say just one thing, I, you know, of my three kids, I've got one kid who's not a camp kid. You know, this is definitely for the kind of kid who might not have, it's, we have our camp kids, but it's definitely also for the kids who are not camp kids. It's more, has a little bit more of an academic, like pre-college program nature. It's designed that way. Um, so we've got lots of kids who have loved their summer program camps. One of the things we do love about it um, is that almost always kids don't know each other when they come. So there's also not the sort of exclusivity that sometimes happens at camp, like you're either in a group and so you keep going because you love that group or you feel a little left out and it's not your place. And this is a brand new set of kids, brand new to know each other. And we do a lot of work just getting them to, to bond. And it happens usually pretty fast. And you know, now 18 years in, we've got alums who have married each other, who have wow. baptized, oh yeah, who and who have baptized each other's kids and who are in each other's weddings and who are co-ministers, you know, in various ways. Um, we've got a bunch of clergy who come through Crossroad. We've got a bunch of presitetas who come through Crossroad, but, but we don't, you know, about 10% of our alums go into ministry and the other 90 are just doing amazing things across, across the world, actually. We've got nuns too. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love hearing this. Um, um, it's, 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 it's awesome when you're running a ministry or you're part of a ministry that brings kids together in that way. Um, and it's not necessarily, you know, the goal of the ministry, but it, it's, it's, it's wonderful when kids can meet other kids that they fall in love with and have the same goals in life and uh, the same perspective. Um, Alex, let me ask you, how did you meet Constance then? Was it through a ministry or was it, you know, just, I'm sure you both weren't sitting in a bar somewhere. I, I, I'm, if you were, forgive me, but I'm just saying that, um, how, how did two Greek kids from Denver and, and Oakland meet? That is a kind of a funny story. So um, it was actually thanks to uh, an Instagram show called Dating Greek. I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, I was sitting at my friend's house, our, our Kubata now, um, and uh, she saw someone on the program who Constance, who was a mutual friend with Constance. They called each other and Constance happened to mention that she was single. So we got uh, hooked up through a mutual friend. Um, and then we, yeah, she was in Nashville at the time and we were long distance, but like cross country. It's very interesting how things- I'm so, I, I'm so excited. We, we need to just do a show on you and Constance because I've known Constance forever. And it's it just, I'm, my heart is full that that's who you, you married when you said Oakland. Absolutely. We'd love so. to come on, talk about camping ministry. She's doing camps this summer too. Um, so yeah, we'd love- Yeah, to let's talk about it. One thing, Dr. Ann, you know that I do, uh, I, I'm the chairman of FDF and, um, and I'm not necessarily the, a, a Greek dance expert. It's not why I do it. I do it because we have a whole bunch of kids that love to be there together and we have an opportunity to give them the gospel, right? But I love, I love when we put our management team together and I see the kids start dating each other and then they start getting married, right? So I, I'm sure it's the same thing with you with, with Crossroad, right? When, you, when they leave and you're like, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. Um, and a lot of times parents will come up to me and say, I'm so happy you do the FDF because our kids need, Greek kids need to meet other Greek kids so that they can develop. And sometimes they'll say, you know, it's not always necessary that a Greek kid meet another Greek kid because sometimes the church can grow if a Greek kid meets, you know, an Irish Italian kid down the street and the Irish Italian kid becomes Orthodox, right? And they, and they develop. Yeah. And so that's how the church can grow. But I'm getting to my question. <laughs> and my question is this, uh, as a parish priest for, for almost 
21 years, um, I, I, I'm a huge proponent of Sunday school. Like we need to educate our kids, we need to give it to them, right? But I learned really quickly that 45 minutes of Sunday school really turns into maybe 27 minutes by the time they get there, by the time they get settled, by the time they have their snack, by the time they get going. And then the teachers, God bless them, are volunteers, but they're not necessarily educators, right? And so they do their best and God bless everybody who rolls up their sleeves to be a, to, to serve in that way. But it's not like, it's not like, a, 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 it's not like a, a, a strong tool in our parishes. I, I mean, I, I feel bad saying that. Um, yeah. And so 27 minutes a week times however many weeks of the year there are for Sunday school doesn't really give our kids a great foundation of faith, right? So when you're finding our kids coming to Crossroad, what is what are some of the top three things that they're really needing to know about the faith? What, what are the top three things that they like, wow, you know, like, uh, and here I'm going to be, I'm going to open up a, something for you. I grew up as an altar boy. I grew up going to church almost every Sunday, you know, as part of my, the rule in, in the house that I lived with my parents. Like we, we went to church every Sunday, the cathedral in LA. I didn't know what orthros was until I got to the seminary. No joke. Like what? Yeah. We have, we do a service before the liturgy. Like I, I show up and, you know, the liturgy is going on and I put my robe on and go. And so it's like, there's a whole other thing. And like my, my whole world of orthodoxy opened up with all that stuff. Right. So what is it that our kids are coming to you? And they're like, wow, like, I didn't know that. That's a great question. Alex, do you want to take that one? We actually, we ask it in their, their we kids apply to Crossroads. So we actually ask that in their application so that we know when they come in sort of what their biggest questions are. They really range, but Alex, do you have a do you have a sense? I would say the questions that they come in with are very much about how the church interfaces with the world. That that they're exposed to a different a different world when they go to school every day in day out, and so their questions in the essays are always like, "What does our church say about about this particular issue?" or you know, how do I interface with uh, friends who are of different faith backgrounds? That's really important to them because they want to make connections with other people who might be different. And so they're trying to figure out, okay, what does my faith actually say about life, death, um, you know, friendship even, or relationships? That's, those are the things that they're really um, concerned about. Um, trying to think of what else. Uh, yeah, I think, what, what do they need to know from a program like Crossroad? Um, I think they need to be convinced in a deep way that God exists and God wants to be in communion with them. Um, I just don't think that, you know, that comes across necessarily in Sunday school uh, always. Sometimes we can, we focus on the details. Sometimes we focus on like um, uh, stories of saints and those are all good things, but at the end of the day, you know, if you don't think you're going to church for a relationship with Christ and that that's what your whole life should be oriented around, then there's, you're going to miss things. I, I, that's the best way I can describe it, but maybe, Anne, if you want to add anything else. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I think the bigger question is, you know, we've got the kids with these really strong questions who come to Crossroad and they're, you know, we've got those. I, I do have a friend, um, parent friend, who both of her kids came to Crossroad, and she's trying to think about what to do at, at for the high school Sunday school. And so just a, probably two month, months ago, she sat down with some of the high school kids at her parish, and it's actually a parish in California. And she was just asking them what they want. And they said, they actually said sort of in this COVID era, um, they are less intent on all of the answers to the big questions and they just need help right now with mental health and time management. Yep. So, you know, I do, I think, um, I think depending on our context, I mean, my, my big, the drum, drum that I beat all the time, I teach youth ministry for Holy Cross students is just, you got to know your own, the own, the own young people in your particular community, um, what they're, present questions are um, so that, you know, you can design based on their real need um, and are meeting that. Um, and that just takes asking them. And to be honest, like I also said to my friend who was asking these high school questions, once you've done the work to listen to young people and to really hear what they're, what, 
what's on their hearts and minds in a way that they can say what they really need to say, get it out, say, how can I, you know, I need help with this. Then you can, you actually have the inroad to teach them about a whole bunch of other things too, that sometimes is not on the radar, but is as important, if not more important than exactly bandaging, putting a bandaid on whatever they need at any particular time. Um, but, you know, there's this great, um, great book that I recommend to everybody called Growing Young, Six Essential Guides. Yep. You love it. Yep. And one of the things it says is that we've traditionally in Parish has thought about how we can have the ratio of one volunteer leader to five kids. And this book recommends we flip that and think wow. about for every one kid in a parish, who are the five adults that you can put in relationship with that kid to nurture their life of faith. Isn't um, that a totally different way of like looking at it? Like what, right? Like it's so- Can you imagine? It's so, yeah, no. And it's, and it's so awesome because it's, you know, like sort of fueling this notion of an intergenerational community that will um, nurture people. It also is rewarding for the ad adults who are involved. Right, right. right? Because, so, because not everybody's a teacher. Like we said, not everybody can be a Sunday school teacher, but everybody in some way has something to mentor somebody, especially if they're church going people that, you know, there's a, a, a retired surgeon who's the chanter now. Right. And, and there's, you, you know, there's the, the engineer that serves in the altar with the priest, you know, and there's all kinds of ways that you awesome. can mentor a young person. Right. Let me ask you now that we're talking about multi-generational because one of my favorite things in that book, growing young, and I talk about it all the time, and I think I need to read the other, reread the other chapters as well because I've memorized the keychain leadership chapter. Like that's my it's that's so my good. that's my gig. If, like that's have, that's have it. Have you me, talked right? about? It? Will you give a summary on the like? Give a well, summary. Basically, I basically, it. I remember, I remember, I remember my mother handing me a key in in the fifth grade to our house and saying, "This is your key to the house." And I was like, "Wow, I got a key to the house. Like I can I can open the lock." Like. I remember having it and I felt like such a responsibility. And in the book, when they talk about the keychain leadership, it's like, it's exactly that. We got to give our kids the responsibility of the church, not just have them come and move tables and set up chairs and stuff like that. We need to tell them, hey, this is what we need. Do it and let them fail. Let them try. Let them fail. Let them go at it and give them the opportunity to be leaders in the church and to, and to take ownership of it. And that's that's where you're going to find them really kind of advocating for the church when, when they're owning it. And so, you know, at, at St. Demetrios in my, in Camarillo where, where I serve, we, we made sure that one booth every year at the festival was run by the youth, like period, like whatever booth it was, usually the ice cream booth, right? Cause that's where you could get them, but we put them in the ice cream booth and they ran it. And it was like, no, you guys need to find your own volunteers and make your own schedule. You need to order your own supplies and do what you got to do. And, you know, we would let them get to the point of almost failing. We wouldn't let them fail, but we would, you know, let them get there. But that's what keychain leadership is. And I absolutely love it. I want to, I want to talk to you though, going back about something that you said about generations. And you said you've been doing this for um, 18 years. So you've seen the tail end of, I don't want to say Generation X, but maybe you saw the millennials coming into you and you probably saw them leave. And now you're seeing Gen Z come to you, right? Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the differences that you're seeing between kids that came in, in 18 years ago and kids that are coming in now? And I feel bad asking that question because COVID has probably wrecked that for you so if you can go before covid and right. give us kids that came in you know pre-covid years and and uh early on what were some of the differences with what what you're seeing in these generations and how are they benefiting from crossroad and then i also i, I want to make sure that our listeners or, or viewers know that i want to talk about a day in the life of crossroad like what happens during these 10 days they're they're staying at a college campus and that so i've got a whole lot of questions written down here but real quick in your experience, you you have a doctor in a doctorate in um, youth Theology. ministry. You're the Theology. professor. Yeah. You're yeah. the professor of youth ministry at Helena College, Holy Cross. So you're you're teaching future clergy how to serve the youth of our of our archdiocese or whoever they come into contact with. What are you noticing about the differences between the millennials and Gen Z, and how Crossroad can serve them? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
uh, I will probably think of many more things that I've forgotten to say after this podcast. But you know, I think I think the clearest, obvious one is just when we started Crossroads, cell phones were not. Oh yeah. A thing, you know, they were not like kids didn't necessarily all have cell phones, or they might have just a flip phone or something. Um, I'll never forget uh, the one year, and we've always taken phones away. That the dynamic of taking phones away has obviously changed drastically because of when you take a kid's device away for 10 days now, it's very different than when you when we used to. Um, and so there's almost, it almost has become more of a watershed moment for young people, um, especially thinking post COVID. I think COVID has led to more, we've, we've, we have seen more mental health challenges through, through COVID and we experienced that the last couple of years, but in general, it, thinking before COVID, um, it becomes more of a watershed because um, the experience of being unplugged, of experiencing silence, of leaning into stillness. We have something every day called be still time, be still and know that I am God. And this moment of just of you in silence alone with God, scripture readings, but just that comfort with silence, comfort with being alone, comfort with figuring out who you are without the buzz of the world. Um, it seems like the importance of that has only sort of exponentially increased. Um, you know, I remember th like there was one year when one of the, one of the crossroaders who I'm still dear, I consider a dear friend and just love her. She halfway through when we gave them back their phones. Um, and this was when texting just and text threads had become a big thing. She brought it over to me and she had 600 messages she'd missed over the five days. And she goes, I don't want it back. I don't want to deal with all this. And so, um, so it's just a, it's a, you know, we're, we think about it all the time, you know, at what's the relationship between, I think about it all the time between young people and, and online communities, um, social media, gaming, everything. So the, the experience to be with each other in these natural human relationships that most of the older of us sort of benefited from just that was our world. Now it's a gift to young people um, and why I feel so strongly that this, this program does have this watershed. It's this watershed moment for so many young people because it's like, oh, this is what life's about. Um, and, and figuring out your identity in Christ is huge. So I would say that. I would say, um, you know, I think another, I'm, I notice a little bit in terms of staff differences. Um, you know, now staff are, we had one, one of our team members jokes, she's a selenial. What does she say, Demos? Oh, zillennial. Zillennial, like half millennial, half Z. The, the, this, our staff this past year, Alex, maybe you can talk to that, just sort of the staff differences now. You know, they were half millennial, half Gen Z and somebody in between. Yeah, we, we had a raging debate on staff last year as to where we all fell. And uh, maybe about half of the staff was a millennial identified that way. We don't really have Gen Z on staff. So the youngers, uh, the younger staffers were like, we are zillennials. We're not, we're not Gen Z, but we understand Gen Z a lot more than you guys do. So it was just interesting to see, yeah, that, um, that dynamic play out. Um, I, I love that. I'm a, I'm a generation Xer and I remember being labeled that. Right. And, um, I get frustrated when I, when I'm called a boomer, cause I'm definitely not a boomer. I'm totally Gen X. Like, like I'm, I'm MTV generation from, you know, through and through. And, uh, and, and so that was our biggest issue, right? Dr. Ann, like when you're watching right. MTV, you, you can't, you know, you can't watch MTV and, and be an Orthodox Christian at the same time. And so, right, right. Um, so, so here we are now, now a parent sends their kid to you for uh, the July 2nd to July 12th at, at, in, in the San Francisco metropolis for Crossroad. July 2nd, they're showing up, they're looking around, they're going, why am I here, right? They're like, uh oh, you what, you want my phone? I, I Come on, what am I supposed to do? They give you their phone. They get settled. Are they in a? Are, are they roommates? They get their own room. 
what what's going on like how, what's happening like tell me tell me how the kid is going because we can talk about the same thing with ionian village where the parents drop them off the airport and the kids are like what you know like we're getting on a plane to go to another country but this is almost the same thing the parents might be dropping them off in the denver airport to fly to san francisco and then so what's what's going on like how does the I, program say, work? I want i want alex to answer this but before i do that i want to say one of the things I've noticed most strongly, and I just want to just energize parents, you can tell your kids to go and make them go, even if they don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> and that is one of the big differences that I'm actually noticing now. Um, one of somebody who works in our office, her parents bribed her to get on a plane. And she had her life changed. She didn't want to leave the program, but she went crying to the airport she did not want to go um and so but you know her parents actually knew she was the right fit for the program there was just some you know sort of teenage drama and right. resistance to parents going on there but you can actually and she had written the essay she'd done enough of it to to get to the program but but you know we have to i think gen x parents and parents younger millennial parents now have to be reminded we still can make decisions that are in the best interest of our children when our children fight us on those decisions. Right, right. So anyway, Alex, sorry. Okay, yeah, so schedule, crossroad schedule. Um, you are picked up from the airport and you are driven directly to the college campus. So as, as uh, Dr. Ann said before, the, this, the, the program tries to really give you the feel of what's it gonna be like entering college because that's where these a lot of these uh, youth are headed. So you go to this college campus, you get settled in your dorm, and then you spend the next day or so really getting to know each other, um, playing games, going to ropes course, um, really, uh, you know, challenge by choice is a, a phrase that people use a lot. We uh, challenge people to come out of their shells, uh, really start to make connections. They, they analyze their strengths. Um, we use the Clifton Strengths uh, uh, model to get them to think about what they're good at, their identity, um, how they can offer their strengths to the world. And then they start taking classes with Orthodox professors. So these are people who are teaching at seminaries. Um, they take a scripture course and a theology course. That's kind of the linchpin of the, uh, of the 10 day experience. Um, but that only happens for four days. So the rest of the time, they are, um, they are visiting Orthodox parishes um, of all different jurisdictions, Russian, Bulgarian, Antiochian. We even, visit, um, we even visit Oriental Orthodox churches, and we learn a little bit about that uh, tradition as well. So they, they see Orthodoxy from all these different perspectives. Um, our staff are also trained to give sessions on Orthodox topics like uh, Orthodox anthropology, uh, love of the elderly, um, sanctification of creation. So we have these, these topical um, kind of discussions that the staff lead as well, so that they are exposed to more orthodox topics in a, in a deeper way. Um, and just to be clear, our staff actually are all, um, what's unique about our program is that all of our staff are e in seminary at, at the time. They're completing graduate coursework um, so they really want to practice their skills, want to share what they're learning, what they're excited about through these sessions. Um, and then we also have guest speakers on a, a, a variety of topics, orthodoxy in the public square. These are people like Dr. Elizabeth Prodromu who uh, worked for the Ecumenical Patriarch. The, the, the participants see their faith in action in the world. And it's not just go to church because my mom says, and do the cross, do the prayer, learn, learn the creed, whatever it happens to be. They're seeing people, professionals who are uh, participating uh, in, in the liturgy of, of life in the world. So um, it's, really, it's really a great experience. And then we cap it all off with a, a beach day at the end and we, we just have a lot of fun. So it's great. Very, very cool. Now, being in San Francisco, if that's if that is the final destination, I'm sure you're going to go see Father uh, uh, Saint John Maximovich over there, right? Absolutely. Have, either you, have you, either of you been over there? I visited once, actually, during COVID. Um, I visited that church, and it was such a wonderful experience. We are going to go back. Um, 
God willing. So um, yeah. Say, we'll, say about it, Father Father Gary. Just give uh, us. A I can tell you. I can tell you this. That look at. Um, I had a. I had a another faith awakening in my life in in the fall of 2018. My brother got really sick, and um, I was never one of those people that was like the saints and miracles and things like that. Um, I was just like we need to depend on Christ, and the saints are good role models and, and that, and we should always depend on Christ. Um, but, but Father Fotios in Seattle, Dumont introduced me to St. John Maximovich and St. John Maximovich created a miracle for my brother. Like, like that's a whole other story, whole other show. But, um, if you go there, um, just consider if you can remember me and just light a candle for him. Um, I try to get, whenever I'm in the bear, I try to get up there and honor him. Uh, it's, his body is incorrupt. It's like going to St. Dionysios in Zakynthos or St. Gerasimos in Kefalonia. Um, right here in America, where you have a, the body of a saint whose body has not decomposed, right? And um, it's an amazing experience to be able to go in there and to see um, people from all, it, it, he's a Russian Orthodox saint, but people from all jurisdictions going in there and honoring him. And it's right in the middle of San Francisco. And you're like, what, you know, like, how, how is this here? And it's it's really, really cool. So get the opportunity to do that and, and to see that and to read about his life and, and what he's done and um, how um, we can all become saints like that, right? And, and how all of these saints would say the, exactly what I said about leaning on Christ, but their example is by far the greatest example we can have about how to live our lives. So giving them that experience is, is fantastic. I'm, I'm really interested in, um, in what it, um, when the kids leave um, after the 10 days, what are the transformations that you're seeing in it? And, and Dr. Ann, I know you're the professor of youth ministry, but my theory on youth ministry has always been when a parent entrusts me with their child for anything, it's my responsibility as a youth minister to give them back in a better state than I found them, right? Like, like uh, I, I've always said that when the kid, parents drop them off for summer camp in Oakland or summer camp here in LA for St. Sophia camp, or even drop them off at my house for, for you know, a, a night to talk about a, 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 a conversation. I always tell myself, it's your job to return them with something greater than they had. So return them better than they had. When you take in a, a young person and you get through the first couple of days of the withdrawals and the symptoms from losing their phone, and then they get into it, what are, what are you seeing when the kids are leaving? What do you, you know, I'm sure there's tears and there's hugging and there's crying and there's, I miss you. And I can't believe we've only been together for 10 days and now we're best friends. But what, what are some of the, what are some of the transformations you're seeing personally with these kids? Yeah, that's a great, great question. I think, and Alex, you can speak sort of from the most recent programs in general. Um, you know, a stories of clergy who picked up their kid and had a long drive and said the faith was not something we talked about, like that my child really wanted to talk with me about. And she talked nonstop the entire car ride home about everything that mattered to her. And, you know, for uh, like a beloved clergy friend of ours to say that about how we're able to just help. We, th we think of ourselves as waterers, you know, the beautiful passage in the epistle, um, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the growth. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, and God gives the growth. We think of ourselves as waterers, you know, uh, clergy and families have planted and we water. So to be able to give back, um, as you said, with a few more flowers or shoots or, you know, brand new things. And then, so we notice that number one, we do, we have parents just say to us, you know, this had an amazing impact on my young person, um, my, my, my child. We notice um, the groups of young people themselves often form um, uh, groups that then do comp line together on their own. They call each other and read through comp line. Um, they uh, have had reunions that they themselves have organized. They visit each other um, across the country. One mother was convinced um, by her son to buy like 18 air mattresses for their basement one Christmas. And they all came back and she pulled us aside and said, this is, these are the friends I've always prayed for, for my son. And so of course I would do this. I mean, you, right. You hear the story and you're like, okay, Lord, I'll keep going as hard as this is. I will keep going. Um, we, um, we have a beautiful young woman who came to the program last year, who as many of her crossroad 
friends are going to Project Mexico this summer to all build houses together. So we noticed that they do that often. That's been a very, very common is that they build houses, they go together to Project Mexico. Um, so that's the, those are some, some little things. I mean, some of them are doing amazing, amazing things all across the country now, um, longer term. Um, Alex, what else would you say? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you did a great job describing. We also, I mean, something unique about this last summer was that immediately um, we started having Zoom meetings with all of the cohorts from the previous summer, just getting together with staff, um, kind of a continued experience that, that was really yearned for by the participants, talking about what's going on in their lives and kind of bridging over to the, to the new experience in college because you know they have this experience right before college and then they get to their campuses and they still wanted to tell their crossroad you know cohort about all the things that they were going through and uh it's just an increase of love i mean that's the best way to describe it is that's the transformation is they they feel more alive and they they know why they're doing what they're doing i love it you you take the water i'll take the dirt with the ministries that i'm i'm part of i'll say that we're the dirt so i <laughs> repeat i love it i love I'll, it I'll, I'll definitely be the dirt i, I can handle that the I'm, compost maybe yeah, the, the compost, compost. Exactly. The compost. <laughs> but um <laughs> let me ask you this though you you sparked something when you said that about our kids going into college campuses H how many of these kids are meeting other crossroad alum at college when they get there like when they show up and they're like hey ocf and then like, wait, OCF, did you go to Crossroad? Yeah, I went to Crossroad. When did you go to Crossroad? And, and then they connected OCF, right? And we talked, uh, Dr. Uh, Ann, before the, 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 the program started about our ministries being silos in our archdiocese and how we can sync them, right? How a, a graduate of I, an alumni from Ioning Village can step right into Crossroad and then from Crossroad to, the, to OCF and then from OCF in there, right? And then the leadership of these different ministries are, are starting to communicate and talk with each other and work right and 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 develop relationships how are you seeing that with like OCF benefiting from crossroad alumni showing up at like you know University of Texas Alex do you want to uh, the, they are becoming leaders Cr crossroad really emphasizes becoming a leader in your own community. So whether that's through OCF or deciding to apply for the uh, Orthodox Volunteer Corps or young adult you know, uh, conferences, you better believe that every time someone's getting together in the Orthodox world, the Crossroad alums, they get together, they take their photos, they send it to us, we put it in the magazine. You know, We keep track of each other, just like a little mini family in the, in the great family of the of the church in America. So yeah, that's, that's what you see there. Are people getting it done for the church and all on all levels. So, yeah, I notice, I do notice, you know, that, um, my, we our our hope is that we keep expanding crossroad so that more kids can come just because, you know, we've always, it's just so clear that it, it has an impact. It's a good recipe. You know, it's like a good lasagna recipe. Things can change a little bit, but it's so beautiful when it's in a new region because you just, it's, it's just beautiful. We noticed it with Chicago. It's a beautiful, um, beautiful experience. It also forms, you know, the, the seminarians who are, the seminary students who are serving as staff is, it's an amazing ministry support as they develop their, their understanding of ministry. So there's all that, but, um, but we just, we want it to expand because what we say about the early years, we only had one session um, until uh, one session of Crossroad for a number of years, then we expanded to two in Boston, and then we added the third in Chicago. And our joke from the early years is we planted a good crop, it just wasn't a big enough crop. Right. So, so that's where I see like, you know, we love it when, when there's a couple of Crossroad alums who meet each other and connect at OCF. And we know that they just get so excited when they've met each other. We have um, Crossroad Institute also runs the Telos Project, which is helping parishes work with young adults um, at their parish to engage them to inspire young adult ministry. And we notice that when there are Crossroad alums on those teams, it's just there's a grounding um, that's so, so helpful. And sometimes I think about it as just as simple as like literacy in faith and being able to talk about matters of faith that is higher in general for somebody who's 
come to Crossroad and even higher when it's a one-two punch IV and Crossroad. Um, it's just no matter what order it's in, it's they, exactly. they just they, it's fabulous. It's an amazing, amazing synergy. So um, let me ask you this though. I don't mean this to sound like like a, a criticism or anything, but I just want to I want to clarify just a couple of things. One is um, when a kid finishes Ionian Village, they're excited because they can come back and offer their services back to Ionian Village by serving on staff, right? right. Um, how, a Crossroad alum is not going to come back and serve on staff because you said that the staff members are uh, seminarians or studying the graduate school. What are some ways that Crossroad alum can give back to the program? Because I know that when I'm, I'm realizing that when somebody benefits from a ministry, there, how can I, how can I help somebody else participate? How can I help somebody else get the same experience? And um, that's how, a great, how can a alumni do that? That's a great question. We might use that question for our strategic planning, <laughs> but, but I think in I'm general, I'm offering something when I take something from you as well. So that's right, great. right. Yeah, no, that's great. We're, um, we do have an alumni advisory board. Um, okay. So a lot of our alums will serve, but that's a fraction of the ones who come. And so I think um, I think that's a great question, Father Gary. I think a lot of them, we've always wanted to have Crossroads sort of feed them back into their home communities, their home parishes, so that that energy is for, for the local church, right? First mm -hmm. of all. So for their priests, their community, we hope they teach Sunday school. We hope they serve on in leadership roles at their parish. When they go to OCF, we hope they'll serve as part of OCF. So we've always thought that is what we're hoping for. Um, I think a bigger question is, you know, how can we do that more systematically and thoughtfully um, in a way that also helps Crossroad? There's a, there's a, you know, about 30 of them serve on our, their ambassadors to recruit kids to come to Crossroad, but I think we have to think about what, that more seriously. Alex, any awesome. other things I'm missing? No, yeah, the alumni community is great and, and active. Uh, we, as Anne said, you know, we make use of the St. Justin Popovich quote, how does a, a teacher become a holy teacher? How does a, you know, professor become a holy professor? How does a, a construction worker become a holy construction worker? So that's kind of the, our mentality in sending our alumni out into the world. And that's where their transformation takes place. But uh, yeah, it's good to think about. Nuts and bolts part of the program now. I've got a I've got a teenager uh, in Austin, Texas that wants to be part of the program. And let's just say that there's room in there's still room in San Francisco, right? They want to go to San Francisco. What yep. is the cost? What, what are they are they paying for tuition? Are they paying for their airfare? Are they paying for their food? Are they bringing money with them? Are they bringing a sleeping bag? What What are some of the nuts and bolts things that that, that the kids need to be prepared to do? Like what what is it? Yeah, great. Uh, 950 is the program cost for 10 days. The alums raise all scholarship aid for their, their younger brothers and sisters in Christ to attend the program. So financial barrier should be absolutely, there should be no financial barrier. And the financial aid application is not, not hard. Um, if, you know, it's wonderful when families can, can contribute that full amount because um, it helps the program, but there's no financial barrier. So 950 a kid for the 10 days. They do also cover airfare, but we have financial aid to cover that as well. So um, once they come to the program, all expenses are covered. You know, there are some excursion afternoons where they might want to have some spending money. Um, they typically bring sheets, um, I think, right? Yeah, Alex, to all of our campuses, they'll bring their own sheets. Um, but that's that's it, I think. That's very cool. So so airfare, airfare is on their own as well, though. Just it's not part of the tuition. Airfare is on their own. But again, like it should not be a barrier. There should be okay. no financial barrier. For the first uh, five years of the program, actually, we we're able to gift the program outright, um, which you know, in a dream world, we love also to be able to do. At the same time, I understand that, you know, uh, somebody's recently done stats, Father Gary, on how much we spend as a church per kid, and it's so little, oh. <laughs> especially when we compare, you know, what we all spend on our kids for our academic education and what we'd spend for an equivalent program at any other college, like a pre-college readiness program or your SAT prep or something else like that, or what we spend on college, that really this is so little in comparison to what we spend um, on things we value. And the question is, do we, do we value um, our kids knowing our Lord? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, right. How do you how do you put a price tag on that? Exactly. Right. That's an awesome. That's a that's a great amount. Nine fifty is a great number. And I, I wish I could say the same about Ionian Village, but it's a uh, it's a little bit different of a ministry, and we're going a little bit farther. But that's God bless you. Well, for, we, we can't uh, compete with Greece either. No, so. but here's the thing, and I and I, I don't mean to bring this up on the show, but you know that I've been talking to you about doing it in Greece, and so there's no reason. Oh, we why would love to. We, we would love we, to. We can't figure out. Maybe maybe we can get some of the alumni excited and do an alumni. Um, crossroad 2.0 or something like that in Greece at Ionian Village and give them the opportunity to come back with their spouses and their body and have oh like a huge my reunion. Gosh. So here that's where ideas blossom, right? And so yeah, and 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 I I love what you guys are doing. I really, really do. I think that um this is like it, it is life transforming. Not that I think it is life transforming. And I, I want to know um what do you see this becoming in the future? Like, what do you see the future of Crossroad being, the, the Institute? Oh, that's great. Um, we want to, we think of our, our ministry in three buckets, transformative education. So education, we really, we think of it as, um, this is, we are, you know, everybody in the church now, I shouldn't say everybody, I get calls on like, who do you have for this position? Who do you have for youth director? Who do you have to run this ministry? Who do you have to plug in? You've called me, right? <laughs> or checked in on that. And so we really see it as like, you know, Crossroad needs to be the network and the leadership feeder. Um, so the more sessions we can offer um, across the country to engage local communities and to just um, let us all get a sense of the hope that there is when we love our kids profoundly in a way that changes them for life, how much that is transformative. So number one, transformative education, education where young people come away and say, yep, that changed my life. So that's our, that's our predominant wheelhouse. Then we do um, ministry, what we're calling ministry R&D, which is we're in a time in the world where um, you know, and I teach this in youth ministry, we just have to try new things um, for ministry. And those are not new things in our, our with our liturgical um, tradition, that is the storehouse from which we draw on our, all our inspiration from. But we take, we have this incredible storehouse and parents need help right now. We need help raising our kids. We need help keeping our kids off devices. We need, like, there's so many things that as parishes we can be trying. Um, for young adults, you know, what I've, what I keep saying is when a young adult in their 20s or early 30s or late 30s walks into a parish to pray, walks in by themselves, we are bearing witness to a miracle and we need to respond to that, welcome them and figure out why they're there and connect them into the life of the parish. We are literally like for a young adult today to think that standing in a church service and worshiping God when they can be at home online doing five other things while it's online, even if they even care about it, but that there are so many other things drawing them away. There's whole online communities. We've got VR going on right now. There's, mm -hmm. there's no logical reason in our world today that young people are gonna show up on a Sunday morning for divine liturgy or any of the other services. So when they do, we're bearing witness to the miracle. Who are the ones who are showing up? How do we fuel and love them? How do we connect them to the life of the church? And how, for the ones who are there, how do we energize them to reach out to their peers, to be really missionaries to their peers, I think, in a world that's hurting, in a world where a lot of people are struggling, in a world where we actually believe we have this historic faith that, um, that, that, is a way to live that's beautiful, where the gospel baptizes culture, isn't afraid of culture, but actually transform culture. We spent a whole class section of youth ministry just saying, you know, we all want, to, there's so many problems with our culture, but there's actually some beautiful things in our culture too. So what, what can we, what can we baptize in current American culture today and just say, okay, we're going to transform our orthodox. We've got to plant orthodoxy here in, in America at soil using all of the goodness of our heritage and transform the communities around us to make them life-giving spaces, not just for us, but for the world around us. Um, so ministry R&D and then the practical resources to just fuel people along. So that's where we wanna go is leaning into um, 
expanding Crossroads Summer Institute, you know, just offering more sessions, offering uh, Crossroad 2.0 for young adults who either need need another another experience of Crossroad or for all the young adults who missed it when they were teens. People keep asking us for that. Um, and ministry, research and development, and then the practical resources. Um, and really the R&D is for everyone. Like what can our parishes be doing? Um, what are we, what are we going to test out and see if that, that can make work from as a professor of, you know, youth ministry at the seminary, I think, how can we also fuel our, our future leaders to know how to engage our youth in and through our parishes in a way that, um, works today because a lot of the research uh, out of the Protestant and Catholic world is saying the old youth group model is just not cutting it anymore. Um, and so what are new ways that we can think about? Um, so, so yeah, like our Goya, like, you know, it threatens Goya. Um, just what are, what are we doing? Um, so anyway, we've been thinking about like, what are, what are new creative ways that we all can come up with that are deeply orthodox, you know? Um, one quick example that I just love is um, Father Peter or Orfanakos' parish, St. Barbara's in Orange, Connecticut. Um, they were one of our Telos pilot parishes and the young adults figured out that um, it was really fun to do house blessings at young adult apartments or homes. And so the young adults just got into doing like visiting each other's homes and, and having Father Peter come and bless the house and having this moment where faith and life is not split, but combined. And how beautiful taking, taking something out of our storehouse that we have and just bringing it to what could enliven people's understanding of life in the world today. Very cool, very cool, love it. We're, we're, we're coming up on the end of our hour here and um, I wanna give you guys the last word on what you wanna say, but um, uh, somebody wants information about sending their kid to San Francisco this summer, July 2nd to July 12th. Where are they going to go to find that information? Crossroadinstitute.org, or they can email me at program at crossroadinstitute.org. Crossroad. So, yeah, program at crossroadinstitute.org. Um, and uh, we have all the information on the website. We would love to fill that San Francisco session in July, again, July 2nd through the 12th. And uh, yeah, it, all the information is there. So send awesome. us your kids, the staff who are staff this summer. I mean, that's the other, we have a Crossroad has a bunch of secret sauce things, but the, as with IV, when you have just these phenomenal young adults, these, these young people are, we, they're the best of the best. They love they love their faith and they're wonderful, warm, fabulous young adults who, you know, young people just gravitate to. So it's fun. I love that our, I love that our archdiocese, that our, that our country, that our Orthodox country has this program. God bless the work that you're doing. And, and that um, anything that you want to say that you didn't get a chance to say so that you guys get the last word. So um, even if you'd like want to say go Broncos, like your shirt saying, I don't know, anything you want to say. I didn't get a chance to say it. I can't say that in Boston all the time, so I can say go Broncos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just say for all of you who may be listening, who, you know, are doing things that are working, I love, you know, as a, as a professor of youth ministry, I love to share those stories. So don't hesitate to reach out um, with those stories and um, just thank you for the hard work of loving young people. Um, it is every every single interaction matters um every single time you have a great conversation with a young person and uh father gary i'm so grateful um that you invited us to be on and for the the work that you do um enlivening fdf ionian village um young people throughout our archdiocese and that you're doing this podcast and bringing all these these folks to speak to a wider audience glory to god glory to god and thank you for doing what you do because you, such qualified people, you, you could be doing a million other things, making a, a, a ton more income than you are, but we know we don't do it for the income. We do it for the glory of God. And it's, it's, a, it's an endearing thing. God bless you. God multiply your efforts. God watch over you. God fill San Francisco and God hope that there's a fourth one in 2023. Okay. So let's, put, let's, let's say that and, and put that out loud as well. So God bless the work that you do. 
I watch over you. And uh, Alex, I'd be remiss to say to you, don't say hi to the Constance for me one more time. Okay. And uh, Dr. Ann, your kids, your husband, uh, tell them all I said hello. And uh, thank you for taking the time to be here and to be with us on Armed with Faith on the Orthodox Christian Network. Thank you. Thank you, Father Gary. Thank you so much.